Great, you should, you should great, get going. terrific. So we'll get going. So uh, welcome to the Private Equity Impact Investing Webinar hosted by Catholic Investment Services. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Tom Langto, and I'm privileged to serve as the Chief Executive Officer of Catholic Investment Services. My colleague, Zayla Astarjan, who has done a great job organizing this program, is at the Zoom, Zoom control panel. Enormous thanks to our all-star panel, who will be introduced shortly. Uh, today's format will be conversational with Sister Suzanne Brennan acting as moderator. There'll be time for audience questions after the formal part of the program, so please use the Q&A feature on your Zoom screen, not the chat feature, but the Q&A feature on your Zoom screen to submit a question. Our audience is muted, and the call is being recorded. Catholic Investment Services was founded by some of the investment industry's most respected leaders to address the investment challenges faced by Catholic organizations. We are a Catholic nonprofit serving other Catholic nonprofits and hope this webinar provides some useful take home value. Today's session builds upon an earlier Private Equity 101 webinar that we hosted in September. Zayla provided biographical information for our speakers, but here are a few additional comments. Our moderator, Sister Suzanne Brennan, has quite a track record as a healthcare CEO and a leader of other community and social service ministries of the Sisters of the Holy Cross. She has served her congregation in senior financial and other leadership roles. Sister Suzanne is also an accomplished athlete, not only a golfer and a skier, but my research indicates that she's also a competitive volleyball player. So <laughs> questions, questions on that later. Uh, a native of Chicago's South Side, she thankfully is a Cubs fan. CIS was privileged to partner with Jackie Rentanen and her colleagues at Hamilton Lane on the CIS's Catholic Impact Fund, which completed its fundraising in June. As head of Hamilton Lane's project management group, Jackie has been an innovative and effective advocate for socially responsible ESG and impact investing in the private markets. Annette Bidart is a 30-year veteran of institutional investment consulting, including over 20 years working with Catholic clients. Her firm, Anco Consulting, now advises clients with over $100 billion of assets under management. A skier like Sister Suzanne, Annette lives in Reno, where she takes full advantage of the outdoor amenities near her native Lake Tahoe. To better, now to better gauge the uh, interest and experience of our audience, we're going to use a Zoom poll to ask you two questions, and Zayla is going to put the questions up. Uh, the first question is, do you currently invest in private equity? And the second question is, are you considering investing in private equity? So please answer those questions if you would. And they'll give us an idea, help, help the panel uh, uh, provide the right kind of uh, guidance for the audience. So thanks again to our exceptional panel for contributing your time and talent and experience today. And here's our results of our poll. So we've got a lot of experienced private equity investors in the audience, so that's good. So that'll, that'll, that'll raise the, uh, uh, the level of discourse uh, by our panels. So uh, while we inadvertently scheduled this session on the uh, Feast of the Immaculate Conception, we fortunately have Sister Suzanne to bail us out of that dilemma. I'm now pleased to hand the program over to our moderator who will appropriately start us off with a prayer. Take this off here. Thank you, Tom. The urgent challenge to protect our common home includes a concern to bring the whole human family together to seek a sustainable and integral development. For we know that as Pope Francis says, things can change. And he says in his encyclica Laudato Si, it is my hope that this letter can help us to acknowledge the appeal, immensity, and urgency of the challenge we face. We pray, move us to create healthier communities and societies and a more dignified world, a world without hunger, poverty, violence, and war. May our hearts be open to all the peoples and nations of the earth May we recognize the goodness and beauty that you have sown in each one of us 
and thus forge bonds of unity, common projects, and shared dreams. Amen. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the session today. We want to thank you for your stewardship and work that you do to sustain and allocate resources to continue your mission and ministries. The objectives, uh, as Tom described this earlier, are to gain a better understanding of private markets and how impact investing and measurement is evolving. And to think about how to incorporate and align Catholic social teachings and Catholic values into a private market portfolio. As he said, we have expert panelists today who have been involved in portfolio allocations with extensive expertise in private equity. So let us begin. Jackie, what is the difference between public and private equity market investments? And in essence, what is the purpose of private equity and just how big of an opportunity is private equity? Yeah, it's a good question so we can level set, although it looks like the audience has some familiarity, but at its core, private market investing is a way to invest in private companies rather than public companies. And the private equity fund is the mechanism in which to do that. So it's an, a professionally managed investment vehicle that makes investments into private companies. What's unique about private markets investing versus public market investing is the process. It is a long-term asset class where value is created over time. And that's the important kind of piece of the puzzle. I, I think the question about um, the opportunity set is also an important one because I think there's a common misconception that private equity is a strategy where you are investing in small niche companies, there's not very many of them. It's actually a target rich environment, the private universe. In fact, if you were to look at the number of private companies with revenues over $100 million, they, that um, pool of opportunities is over six times the public companies of the same size. And so that's the US number, so if you were add to it, the rest of the world, you can see that it's a huge opportunity set. And I think one of the important dynamics that we are aware of today that really adds to this is that the number of public companies are shrinking. And so many companies are choosing to stay private. Without a private markets program, investors are missing the exposure um, to a huge part of the investing universe. Often these are companies that drive innovation and ultimately economies. But at the end of the day, the reason to invest in the private markets, in addition to the diversification benefits that I just mentioned, is for return opportunity. Over the long term, private market investments have outperformed their public market peers. In fact, 19 out of the last 20 years for both buyout and credit, private markets investments have outperformed public markets. So these investments can be very additive to an overall investment portfolio. Thank you. That's a great point that you don't have to give up returns in order to uh, achieve a social change. Thank you. Annette, how does private equity fit into the menu of investment choices available to sophisticated institutional investors today? Well, private equity is an investment option open uh, to institutional investors. Uh, so often committees uh, have to address uh, the minimums and what they're comfortable in investing in. Uh, but why do they invest? And, and uh, we've heard some of the comments uh, is most institutional investors need a rate of return greater than inflation. And today, when we look at the Fed telling us that they're going to keep short-term interest rates lower for longer, and that means zero to 0.25% today, uh, the 10-year paying less than 1%, uh, we have to look at other investment options uh, for a rate of return greater than inflation. And then we look at equities. Uh, what we expect out of private equities when we're building out our portfolio is something in the line of two to 4% greater 
uh, than our expected rate of return from public equities. And to put that into context, back in March, uh, we adjusted and updated our capital market assumptions from for public equities to provide a rate of return of, of 7.2%, that's our guesstimate, and, pub, and private equities, that was public equity, 7.2, and uh, private equity at 9.8%. So the opportunity to get a greater return makes it attractive uh, first and foremost, and our expectations uh, are for a greater return. But you have to give up liquidity. Uh, that is not something that is, uh, and the, depending upon what type of private equity you choose to invest in, uh, that could go from uh, three years up to 15 years that uh, these investments can be a liquid. So uh, working with that up front, uh, the liquidity constraints, and then working within your investment policy statement or IPS is where you really need to start. And we think it's also really important, not just because of the, the correlation to other asset classes, uh, but as we look at uh, passive index funds or the public markets today, they are concentrated uh, amongst a handful of names and uh, private equity allows you to diversify away from that. So those are some of the key points that we look at initially. So Annette, what are the basic strategies classified within private equity? Um, how have, have these evolved over, the, over time? Right, uh, so they have evolved. Uh, I know when my clients first started, started investing in, in private equity, we looked at fund of funds pretty much exclusively to get the diversification. And then we stepped out into secondaries uh, because when you start investing in private equity, you wanna make a commitment to invest in it for the long term and have multiple vintage years. So one way to get that is through secondaries or an evergreen fund. Uh, but then how it's evolved over time as once uh, committees have, uh, or investment pools have developed their private equity, and it sounds like a lot of people on the line are already investing in private equity, then we start taking a look at uh, segments of the private equity market. And that might include venture capital, which is one of the last things that we like to invest in, or we limit that because that's considered the most risky of the uh, various types of, of uh, private equity. Now, some would argue, no, it's not that risky. Um, but, uh, and that, those are the, the biotech, healthcare, clean tech funds that we typically look at. And then growth equity uh, for small growing businesses. Uh, and that time horizon. So the, the time horizon on venture capital is anywhere from eight to 12 years or longer. Uh, growth equity, maybe five to seven years, buyouts. Uh, and these are taking smaller companies um, uh, and maybe even keeping them private and then selling them on the, on, the, on the private market. And that time frame we typically say is between five to 10 years. Uh, and then turn around distressed. And we see this, uh, there was a lot of opportunity early on. Uh, we saw money being raised in the private equity and private debt side. Um, and I have a dog in the background, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, but we have some, uh, the managers coming to us and saying, look, we've got a lot of opportunity where we think we're gonna see a lot of opportunity in the private equity and debt. Uh, but that seems to be waning a little bit. So there are cycles uh, that we look at, not just the category, venture capital growth, equity buyouts, turnaround and secondaries. There's times when those different uh, opportunities are more attractive than other times. Uh, so I think that's how it's evolved uh, in uh, segment, segmented, uh, but first you wanna start out with a well-diversified and maybe even an evergreen fund. Mm -hmm. Great. And this is really helpful, and I think we can uh, come back to some of the questions that, that uh, we want to ask, um, you know, when we're thinking about investing in private equity. So good points. Thank you. Jackie, there is a lot of discussion around ESG and impact in today's markets. Can you define each term, please? Yes, absolutely. And I would say, especially over the past year, kind of the twin themes, if you will, of environmental, so, social, and governance, which is ESG, and impact investing have really rapidly increased their visibility. 
And I think you see that on both the public side and the private side. Certainly uh, the increasing awareness of climate change and the um, global impacts of the pandemic have challenged us all to consider the, the world in a, in a much bigger way in, in all of our activities, but certainly in our investing activity. But I think you're right to identify that there's some kind of common areas of confusion that we see between um, ESG and impact. And I, I think it stems from the differences between their investment approaches. So while ESG and impact are often viewed similarly because there's often a social value um, incorporated, they're really distinct and not notable differences. So simply put, ESG is an investment tool. It helps to manage risks and opportunities across all investment strategies. Impact, however, stands on its own as a way to generate both financial return and a desired socially impactful outcome. So institutional private markets investors view ESG lens as kind of a framework to evaluate investments and to think about risk. While an overlay of social conscience um, often exists, the primary purpose for many institutional investors who employ ESG today is to deliver better risk-adjusted financial performance. Whereas impact investing, I think, goes a step further and incorporates investments that will, again, produce that, that positive financial performance, but also important positive impacts to society. Thank you. Annette, how would you characterize the risk return case uh, for private equity over the long term, let's say over 10 years? Oh, you're on mute. Annette, you're on mute. Thank you. All right. I think it's important that you mention long term because that's the first uh, uh, factor that you have to consider uh, when investing in private equity. Uh, yes, we like the returns, but are you really prepared for the risk of the illiquidity? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our expected returns are about two to four percent greater than public equities with similar risk. Now, the difference of the risk is uh, public equities are priced daily, uh, where private equity is priced uh, once a year with the K-1, and uh, or unless there are some type of uh, adjustment um, to those individual securities uh, throughout the, the course of the year, the uh, investment team will uh, either raise those prices or lower them based on an uh, particular event, but normally they're priced at book. So you get this nice steady even return that makes your volatility look uh, less. Uh, but the problem with, the, I think the biggest risk in my mind with private equity at the end of the day is you never know how well it's gonna do until it's all done. And so where the risk comes in uh, and, and the due diligence that's so necessary is understanding how the, the different firms deal with uh, liquidity and then uh, events of how, if there's lingering funds left over, um, how do they uh, sell those securities out and close the fund out? Those are the, kind of the, the risks that you need to ad address early on um, and understand how the management team deals with that. And then maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, both of you could comment on how do most institutional investors think about implementing their private equity allocations. Jackie, you want to start? Sure, I, I'm happy to start. I, I think Annette touched on some of it, and I think it's about having both a short-term and a longer-term perspective. It's really about understanding your unique objectives as an investor and factoring in things like your ability to, um, to deal with illiquidity or not your time frame, what the rest of your portfolio looks like, and then to establish a strategic plan around those unique objectives and, so, and to invest over the long-term, to have that kind of long-term horizon, but to take a strategy that allows you to execute on an annual basis. The um, programs that we have seen both, you know, for our, our, our clients and for others, that have really um, performed the best in this asset class are those that have taken a long-term horizon that have, you know, it, it seen, it, you know, kind of embraced a view towards 
a tactical annual plan, but a bigger kind of strategic plan that meets their unique goals and objectives. Every investor is different, so there's not, no one way um, to kind of build a program, um, but certainly knowing your objectives and, and um, executing accordingly are the best way to, to get started. Great. Annette, would you like to add to that, please? Uh, I'll add a little more of the administrative side, I, although we're the investment consultant, we do a lot of due diligence on the firms, but I think every plan sponsor and committee trustee group, uh, they have to look at their staff and how they're able to deal with the capital calls, mm -hmm. uh, late K-1s. Uh, so ask all those questions up front uh, before investing um, and then obviously updating the IPS. Uh, I work with clients that we actually put a limit on how much we can invest in not just private equity, but illiquid assets. And we defined illiquid as something that you can't sell within one year's time, or you can define it however you want in your investment policy statement. But those are the three sort of administrative things that uh, committees and plan sponsors should consider is the staff time uh, to implement it. Oh, and I'll make the last final. And that is just that, and I already mentioned this once before, the long-term commitment. So if you're going to do it, don't just do one fund and then forget about it. And, and 20 years down the line, a committee member saying, why do we still have this in here? I think it's a, a if, if you wanna invest in private equity, and I think there's a, a strong case for institutional investors to be there today, uh, make a commitment for the long-term that you will fund it year in and year out and keep your allocation there and then take advantage of different parts of the private equity market uh, as they become more attractive or less attractive mm -hmm. and avoid those. And what uh, other advice would you have for smaller institutions who are just maybe beginning to get into um, private equity uh, portfolios and strategies? Mm -hmm. The first thing that we do is provide a primer, a private equity primer to our committee members and educate the board uh, about what private equity is and the different parts uh, so that you have uh, buy-in. Uh, then I think for initial investors into private equity, uh, looking at secondaries or, pri or potentially even evergreen funds, um, those have a lot of attraction just because you get that automatic diversification. Uh, if you want to start with your very first fund uh, and just do a fund of funds, uh, that's an option as well. But my recommendation would be to commit to adding to those funds of funds so you have multiple vintage years, mm -hmm. uh, year after year. Uh, so, and then make sure you keep your investments appropriate sized. Uh, so one of the issues that uh, clients have is the, they make the commitment, but the capital calls come in uh, slowly and uh, they're underweight their target. And so then they need to add another private equity fund so they, they get closer to their target. So, uh, and not knowing when. So having a, a clear defined path of when those capital calls are to be expected and keep that into perspective with your overall portfolio so that you have the uh, liquidity to fund those capital calls and knowing how to do that. I realize uh, uh, in the session, there are a number of persons who are in private equity already, but my experience is uh, you're in it and you do it and you need to though come back and, and ask the same questions or new questions um, as, you, as you get more into private equity and learn more about it. Could we just kind of review what kind of questions you think uh, it's definitely you should ask managers um, before you get into certain private equity. Uh, do you want me to take that? Uh, first off is uh, how timely are your K-1s? That seems such like, like such a strange question to be asking, but it's often where I see my clients have some of the biggest frustrations. And uh, But then as, when it comes to investing in the firm that you're going to be investing with, First and foremost, are they registered with the SEC? Do they have their ADV? I remember a firm calling on me and, and uh, I just did a little bit of due diligence and, and they didn't have an ADV. And that's just sort of a, a beginning step. Uh, five, 10 years ago, many private equity firms did not 
they were not registered with the SEC. And Jackie, maybe you can comment on that, but I think that's really important for institutional investors. Not all private equity man managers will have that. Um, and then experience uh, the team. We always talk about the five P's in any form of investment, investing, uh, the people, the process, make sure you understand the process, the performance, how did that performance, how was it achieved, uh, the price. So understanding all of the fees involved with private equity because it's not as clear uh, as it is with public equities, it's priced daily. Um, uh, so people, and then the process, I think people, performance, process, price, oh, and then the philosophy. Uh, understanding those are just critical, whether you're in a public equity search or a private equity search. Uh, people will come and go in private equity. So having that stability of a team, I think is really important. Thanks. Jackie, would you like to add anything to that? Sure. I, I mean, I think Annette has touched on uh, so many of the important points. It, so it's, but it's worth reiterating that finding the best managers is a lot of work in this asset class. And so information is not as, as easily or equally available in the private markets. But once you have the information, you can dig in. And, and that's really um, what it takes is understanding, uh, as Annette said, like how they add value. Remember the whole thesis with private markets is to buy companies, to do something with them, you know, enhance their revenues, grow their distribution, fix them if, if your strategy is distressed and to exit them at a higher value. And so really understanding that piece around performance and whether what was done in the past is replicable. Are they following a strategy, geography, investing in the type of company that they've done before? And then again, understanding if the team who created the performance in the past is the same team that's going to be investing in the future. And so, you know, not all managers are the same, not all strategies make sense, um, and, and not every manager or strategy makes sense in every market environment. And so marrying the pieces of, you know, the thesis of the manager, the strategy in which they're pursuing, the objectives that you have for your portfolio, and the market in which you're investing to make sure that those pieces align. Uh, again, a lot of work, but the performance um, and the diversification and the portfolio benefits, um, we believe make it worth that extra work. Right. I'm gonna add one comment, sister, which I neglected to add in private equity, big L, leverage. How much leverage uh, are these managers using to uh, acquire or, or get the returns that uh, they have in the past and what they expect to do in the future? How much leverage do they wanna use? And Jackie made a really important comment too about uh, the active management of the team. Are they just going to go in there, lever the firm up and, and turn around and sell it? Or are they going to actively get involved in uh, that company? And I'm going to give you a quick example of one that was a home run for a manager. It was a, a tortilla factory, um, small local, and this was a buyout opportunity. And they took that tortilla factory owners and they said, look, we think we can help you grow your business. And and we'll get your uh, tortillas and, and your chips um, in Walmart and Costco, et cetera, and the front lines. And, and that company ended up being this small mom and pop shop into a billion dollar tortilla company. Um, so, but it, it took the private equity money and the private equity know-how and, and the hands-on that really made that company grow that helped the owners, uh, they, they took, so they didn't just fire everybody, they built the company up. And I like stories like that. I wanna hear those kind of stories. So just a small little side story. There are lots of them, but now I'm hungry. <laughs> I was gonna say, I hear more of those stories in food than in other, other areas. So um, before I turn this over to Tom to talk about the, uh, alignment of the Catholic social teachings with investments. Are there any other points that you would like to make? You know, I, we touched on it very quickly, um, sister, but I think worth emphasizing when we're talking about specifically impact investing, I think there's a misconception that impact investing means, um, you know, 
subpar returns um, in mm -hmm. private markets. And, and I think that it's important that investors understand that as more and more kind of institutional capital has flowed into this market segment, many investors are seeing that there's a the, the market shifts that we're experiencing right now, we were experiencing them before the pandemic, some of them have accelerated it, that there's a really kind of significant investable universe um, that don't necessarily require a sacrifice to returns. And so many cases that we see investors are, are seeing that the category of impact investing as a segment that's really capitalizing on some of these disruptive economic and social trends. And so um, we think, of course, with any investment, it's really important to have that strong underwriting and diligence process that we just talked about in order to be able to determine that, but to understand that um, you know, impact investing can be on par with your other private markets um, exposures, um, so long as you do those important kind of diligence pieces. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That you do not have to sacrifice returns, you know, for for do, for doing impact investing, and you can accomplish many good things. So, Tom, would you like to uh, take up the question of how does one align uh, private equity with Catholic social teachings, please? Yep. Happy to do that, sister. So let me answer that question. Then I'll, I'll answer that question if I can ask a question after I'm done. But uh, so let me answer that question in the context of, of our Catholic Impact Fund, which we, again, we partnered with Hamilton Lane on and recently completed its fundraising. Catholic Investment Services has developed a very robust, distinctive, and thoughtful Catholic socially responsible investing process. And in our original focus, when we first started, uh, uh, was to uh, on screening to avoid doing harm. And so we use the, the SRI guidelines issued by the U.S. Catholic bishops. And, and but we're, it, it, you know, sister mentioned in the beginning, uh, uh, particularly with her prayer, uh, you know, these, these issues are continually, we're, we're continually refining our, those principles. And we've incorporated most recently some of the, some of the, you know, uh, uh, feedback from the Laudato C papal encyclical. So, in in for for private equity, we we partnered with a firm Hamilton Lane that that really understands and has experience with both faith based and socially responsible investing. And I think, as as both uh, uh, Jackie and Amanda have pointed out, a great advantage of private equity is the ability to make positive and intentional investments in areas that align well with Catholic SRI principles. So. So our fund, Catholic Impact Fund, and again, that fund is closed. It's not, not I want to make it clear that that, that uh, fund is closed. We're not offering that today. It's just, uh, this is historical information. So that fund focused on energy and environment, health and wellness, uh, financial empowerment, and community development. And, and so we were able to really align the uh, investment uh, uh, objectives uh, with, with the Catholic SRI principles. You know, another example is that, Catholic uh, private equity can offer Catholic investors a way to pivot from uh, fossil fuels into emerging te energy technologies that are uh, uh, really offer uh, and other climate friendly investments. So through our fund, we were able to uh, invest in companies that, as Jackie said, not only do these great things, but we also think are great businesses offering attractive returns. Thank you. So could I ask a question, sister? Yes, you may. So what, what so again, we, uh, as, as sister, as you said, and, and Jackie, there's a lot of conversation about impact and, and ESG. And so, so what questions, if, 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 if you're a private equity investor and you're you know, a sophisticated private equity investor, you've, you've got experience in private equity, you've got, uh, you've got some portfolio uh, investments, but you want to focus on impact. What are the questions? And I'd, I'd open this up to Annette too. But what, Jackie, what are the questions that we ought to be asking you, okay, or any other uh, private equity manager who's who's uh, calling themselves an impact investor? Yeah, it's a great question. I think there are there are several of them, but I would say that the first place to start is um, to understand how the manager defines impact. 
how they'll manage and gauge the impact component of their strategy. So one of the things that, that we didn't talk about it and, and really gets to your question is around um, you know, measurement. So obviously private markets are very well um, uh, kind of practiced and experienced in financial performance measurement and, and reporting, but the impact measurement identification, kind of tracking and verification and then reporting to investors is something that is still evolving. And it's a really important piece of the equation. There has to be demonstrable returns on both the financial side as well as the impact side. And so that's the first piece. Understand kind of what the manager is pursuing, how they are going to identify the impact and how they're going to measure it. And then it's a lot about understanding some of the things that we talked about earlier, which is, you know, which strategies are you pursuing? Annette talked about venture and buyout and credit. All of those strategies could pursue kind of traditional private markets investing or impact private markets investing. And so you just want to understand what the underlying exposures will be. And then as with any private markets investing or any investing, you want to understand that the manager has the deal flow and the experience to then execute on the strategy. Great, thanks, sorry to butt in. No, no, good, oh, question. good question. So we have a few questions that have coming in. Um, and by the way, one of the attendees commented what a great panel of women. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy but to be part of it. I'll go on. Um, I'll, I'll erase myself then. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's start. And by the way, feel free to type questions in the Q and A section, and we'll we'll address them. Let's start with this first one that came in a few, uh, seven minutes ago, uh, and this one is for Jackie. With about one trillion in institutional money wanting to get into pri venture and private equity, have valuations gotten too high? Well, it is a great question. And it's one we talk about a lot. And I think it's important to understand that prices are high. Prices are high on the public side and prices are high on the private side. What's important um, to look at beyond just the purchase price multiples, which should be looked at is what's the strategy. And so you can buy a company inexpensively, but if you can't improve it and sell it for a better price, it doesn't matter what you bought it at. You have to understand, is there um, embedded value that the manager sees? Does, do they have a strategy through which they can extract that value and, and really still perform? I think in this market, what you would find is that most managers are underwriting to lower purchase price exits than, or, or excuse me, lower um, multiples at exit than at purchase because of that high pricing. And so, so long as they are creating value above and beyond that price um, differential, then there will still be performance to be had. So it's an important component. It's not the only component. You have to understand how that's going to factor into the strategy and the execution. Great answer. Um, next question. Uh, can you please, and again, I think let's start with Jackie and maybe Annette, you can add afterwards. Can you please comment with your thoughts regarding private equity investments in consumer staples and also in healthcare? Well, they are certainly two really interesting areas right now. I would add technology to that. It's no surprise that, you know, the world in which we're living has enhanced the kind of use of technology um, for all of us. Here we are on this Zoom. Um, but I, I think when you pull back and you think about where we are um, in, in the kind of landscape of an economic cycle or kind of an opportunity set, it's easy to understand that areas like consumer staples, so think about things that are necessary that people are going to buy, even if they're kind of pinching pennies, um, are kind of helped in, um, you know, kind of recessionary, resilient type of, a, of a opportunity set. So they are an area where we do think, you know, exposure and interest um, uh, is warranted. I think healthcare, we see um, such a critical part of, you know, our lives uh, 
always, but uh, certainly a, a spotlight has been shown on that. Um, technologies are changing healthcare, the way healthcare is being delivered is changing. So it, it will continue to be um, kind of a, a evolving and evolutionary part of the market. And so a part that we think that investors should be at least understanding and looking at um, and, and considering exposure for. So the private markets, again, long-term nature, control-oriented, change-oriented, really kind of lend themselves to strategies like that. Annette, did you want to add to that? Sure, I'll just add a few comments on the healthcare of what I'm hearing from different private equity managers. And uh, one of them was maybe five or six years ago, they were somewhat frustrated in, in uh, and this was more in the venture capital space and in, in investing in healthcare because the uh, approvals were so slow from FDA and, and, and other entities. And uh, they just felt that they were kind of banging their head against a wall. And that's changed. I'm hearing that's really changing now. So uh, from an opportunity set, um, sometimes you have to look at the regulations and what's going on there. And then Jackie had mentioned uh, technology because technology and healthcare uh, just go together these days. And that intersection or the convergence of when we think of how quickly this vaccine came out, well, the computing power uh, to run tests uh, and, and uh, samples is just so much greater than it was five or 10 years ago. So there's some really interesting opportunities as a convergence of faster computing power uh, come into the healthcare market. You think of 3D printing and doing organs and things that uh, you know, we ne could never do before. So there's some uh, really interesting opportunities, I think, in the healthcare market. Uh, but I wouldn't put 100% of my money in that spot. Um, it's still an emerging uh, space. And then some of the, let me add more, one more point um, of what I'm hearing on the healthcare side. Some of the best performing companies have been those not uh, coming out with the new drugs and things, but those that will actually help us implement uh, the the vaccine, so the little syringes or how you get there or the ice boxes. So often what's so exciting and fun about private equity is, is these off the wall companies that, that invest or, or have created their own niche uh, to help uh, distribute uh, the healthcare uh, benefits. So it's investing in those niches that aren't available in the public market. So there's a lot of interesting opportunities there. Very Absolutely. true, Annette, like cold chain logistics I'm sorry, Sister Susan. Yeah, I was just going to add that as the reimbursement to healthcare changes from volume to value, uh, that we will see a lot of opportunities in IT to be able to, we don't know how to measure that well yet. And so as we see that evolve and change, I think there are going to be many opportunities, uh, especially in IT, to impact in, in healthcare. I was going to add one more thing too. One of the questions I always ask a team or a board is how many women do you have on your team? How many do you have on your board? I think it's uh, uh, important to add that for gender diversity. You know, this is an area that has been long talked about, but I think the changes are, are really being embraced and many, many, many investors are making that diversity a requirement. And I think it's great news for all of us. Um, it may be a long time in coming, but I, I do think that the, the that that trend will not uh, reverse. Great, thanks for adding that. Thank you. And um, there's a question that I think should go to Annette about if somebody is just starting in private equity, Catholic institution, let's say, starting in private equity, how should they go about doing that and adding it to their investment policy statement? Because these are, after all, illiquid investments and there's, I'm sure yeah. you've, you've been through that journey. And then yeah. I'll, I'll reiterate uh, some of the points I made, uh, educating the board, doing a, a primer on what is private equity. I know you guys put one out that I thought was very good. Uh, so making sure you have buy-in from the board, uh, updating that IPS for allowing the illiquid investments in there and defining that, uh, looking at uh, investment options that are diversified. So we, I, Kind of got off on the healthcare uh, opportunity. Uh, that's a sector, and and so to start out, you really want 
um, a well diversified fund and even potentially with some secondaries in there to get diversification. Or if it's your first fund and uh, in, 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 uh, that you're investing in that you make that commitment, just, okay, we're gonna put in X percent this year and understand, and then next year we'll, we'll look at a new fund and then the following year a new fund. Uh, so that you are getting and building that uh, diversified portfolio within private equity uh, and having that discipline, making sure your staff and your team uh, are available to meet those capital calls that can be onerous uh, because you have to drop everything and working with your consultant or your custodian uh, that you have the cash and the, the, the money is wired timely. Those are just administrative things, but they can, once you have somebody on your staff start complaining about how onerous this is and they look at the fees, uh, you, can, you can say, oh, we, we tried it, let's get out of it now. And I think it's really important to make a long-term commitment at year after year and, and just know what you're getting to up front, into up front. Is that helpful? Jackie, yeah, very helpful, thank you. Jackie, anything from your end um, you wanted to add? I think Annette captured it well. Okay, uh, we have a question just just came in. Uh, can you speak to the importance to about a network, the tenure to build out a network? How important is it to remain in the market? And I think this is for you, Jackie. Yeah, it's a good question in terms of if I'm understanding it correctly, you know, really being able to access the managers. Private markets are unfair in terms of um, investors' ability to access particularly the best performing managers. And so it is a part of the um, kind of opportunity set to kind of invest. We talked about the long-term nature. Some of it is to be able to kind of continue to gain that exposure and access. I think that, you know, building relationships and, and um, being able to show yourself as a long-term partner does help in those situations. Um, so it, it's a good perspective to have. And I, I, and I think it's a, it's a good um, kind of approach to take in this market. Great, thank you. Um, have a question for Sister Suzanne. Um, what are some of the impact themes that, you know, you, you, you care about at the Sisters of the Holy Cross and that uh, you're looking to be invested in? Um, we uh, set a goal uh, to become carbon neutral. Uh, the date may be a little unrealistic, but uh, we do have that goal. And so um, when we are um, looking for impact investing, uh, we look in that direction uh, so that we can achieve that goal. Um, we also, um, you know, in terms of some of the questions I was recalling when we began to um, look at this, it was so important that our philosophy or our vision was very consistent with our, our manager's vision and philosophy. And so, um, and that would be basically um, how, to, how to make those in poverty um, come out of poverty, how, what, what could be done in that sense. And we did invest in a, a, a small project uh, in Peru uh, with the growing of blueberries. And um, it was, it's been very successful in terms of um, providing jobs for people, um, doing training, uh, community organizing and so on. So that's, that's kind of where we look. But when we, when we began, I would say, um, we looked at uh, what you brought up before, our liquidity. Uh, a number of religious congregations in the United States, their numbers are decreasing and what we call sister services are decreasing. So um, operating revenue is decreasing. So that was very important um, to us um, uh, to understand the liquidity and how we could, how we, you know, how we looked at that and how we could manage it, um, thinking, of course, of the worst case that could happen, you know. Uh, so I think we got more realistic and decided the worst case wouldn't happen if it did, you know, it'd be okay. Um, so, so that was a big hurdle, I think, for us in understanding um, that and what a long-term uh, commitment it is. Uh, but uh, again, achieving some of the goals that we want to achieve, they're long-term goals. 
and it fits with, with the uh, strategy. Great. So does this mean some of the blueberries we eat here are coming from Peru? If you eat blueberries right now, they are coming from Peru. Wow, that's great to know. Yeah. Well, and, it, and it's good for COVID. Right? Blueberries are good for yeah. vitamin C. Yeah. One of the um, interesting things in terms of sustainability too is this particular place, it's it's hundreds <clears throat> and hundreds and hundreds of acres. And it's all it's all built on sand. And they learned this technique from Israel. And all all the water, it's drip, you know, it's drip water and so it's a savings, it doesn't evaporate from going up in the air goes to the plant source and so on. So it's been very, you know, in terms of efficiency and sustainability, very, very good. So yes, and the blueberries are from Peru that you're eating now. I love that story. Um, have a question for Jackie. Um, how important is AI or artificial intelligence and also big data? How does Hamilton Lane use the data it has? I'm really glad um, that that question was asked because it's an important one. I mean, data and information obviously is important to all of us making decisions, particularly around investing decision. I think Hamilton Lane has long embraced data um, and we've invested in technology, but I would say today we have data that dates back in the private markets over 50 years. It's it represents $13 trillion of private markets investing. It's over 40,000 funds, over 70,000 companies. And so we have, uh, again, embraced the value of data. We use it daily in the decisions that we make for on behalf of our clients, in the information sharing, in the portfolio modeling and underwriting and pacing analysis that we do. So I think um, data is an important one. This asset class has... Um, has not kind of uh, been at the forefront of data uh, like the public markets have, but I think that's changing. I think technology will change that just like it has in other industries. And I think it's important that investors um, uh, require that and, and, and really kind of um, push for data so that uh, they can make good informed decisions along the way. Right, any, any other questions, Tom? Last call, last call. No, this is last great. Call. So, so, Sister Suzanne, uh, Annette, Jackie, thank you very much for the doing all the heavy lifting today. We really are grateful for your uh, participation, and I know uh, the audience is, is is too. And and to our audience, thank you for joining us. Uh, please be healthy and safe. Zalo and others will be following up to see if you have any further questions, and we're happy to make. Uh, connections for you with any of the any of the panelists uh, or or with any anybody on our team but again thank you please be healthy and safe and best wishes if we don't see you before the holidays best wishes for a merry christmas i think that uh, concludes our program nobody ever gets no nobody ever uh, complains about finishing a little early thank you all right thank you all thank this was you great all. All right. merry christmas and happy new year bye-bye stay safe